I'm going to start us off with uh, quadratic functions, Eliza. Okay, so I think we're very familiar with this form. We spent a lot of time, uh, a whole class devoted to solving quadratic equations, and that's where f of x is equal to zero. Um, so today we're going to look at um, another form of a quadratic function that will help us graph a quadratic um, function very quickly to get a sketch. So let's take a look at, at the quadratic function in a little different form. We know that the parent of all quadratic functions is the function f of x equals x squared. You can probably see that in your sleep by now. The point 0, 0 is called the vertex of this function. So right here, um, the point 0, 0 is called the vertex. And in this particular case, the value, the y value of 0 is the smallest value on this entire parabola. It's called the minimum point. So in this case, the vertex is the actual minimum point. Okay, so if I asked you to consider g of x now, g of x is going to be a function that is, tr is a transformation of the parent function x squared. Let's look at this particular equation for our transform function. And can you tell me what has happened to my parent function from looking at this? There's three transformations we have to identify. So one person at a time. Does anybody want to give me the first transformation they see or recognize? Yeah, Katie? It moves, it shifts down three units. Okay, shifts down three units. And that we got from looking at this. That's number one, which will be purple. We'll make the next transformation red. What's the next one you see, Andy? Uh, shifts to the right. Shifts right. One unit. And we see that pre-operation inside here before we even get to square. OK. And there's one other one going on. Can anybody tell me what the other one is? Anybody? Oh, Andy, you've already had your turn. It's going to be up to someone else, but thank you for trying to help. Isabel? And that's right here. It's a factor of two is outside our squaring. Outside our function, post operation tells us there's a vertical something going on. And since 2 is greater than 1, it's going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. OK. So those are our three transformations. So let's list some key points on our parent function, the x squared function that we have graphed right before us. And let's do these transformations. So we've got the point negative 2, 4. We've got the point negative 1, 1. We've got the point 0, 0, which is a pretty important point. It's our vertex point. We've got the point uh, 1, 1. And we've got the point 2, 4. So let's perform these three transformations on each point and see where we arrive. Well, I'm going to start with my vertex. Let's start with our vertex. So 0, 0, if I shift down three units, which of my coordinates get, gets affected when I shift down three units? Which of, which of my coordinates, my x coordinate or my y? y? Your y. So what will be my first, if I, what will be the coordinates of my point here if I shift down three units? What will happen in the 0, 0? What will it become? The coordinates of my vertex. Anybody? Zero, negative three. So I've subtracted three. So I've performed this first thing here. Shifts down three. Now I've got a shift to the right one. 
so that's not going to affect my y value at all. So what's going to happen to the point 0, negative 3 if it shifts to the right one? 1, negative 3. And then finally, I've got to stretch vertically by a factor of 2, which means all my y values get multiplied by 2, so I get negative 6. Okay, is that, does that make sense? No. Why doesn't that not make sense? What order should I have done this? What was the big box at the end of your transformations? Yep. You got to do your shape changing first before you do any shifting. So everything I just did is wiped out, scratch it. We got to start here. That's where we start. We start with any shape changing first. So if I multiply the y coordinate here, the y coordinate by 2 doesn't change. 0 times 0 is 0. So that didn't do anything. Now it doesn't matter which I do the horizontal or vertical shift. So I'm going to shift it right one unit. So that means I add 1 to my x value. So I become 1, 0. And then this says my y value gets 3 subtracted from it. So I'm going to subtract 3 from my y value. So I'm at 1, negative 3. So that's my new vertex. I've moved to the right one and down three, to the right one and down three. So let's put that in, right one and down three. Here we go. There's my new vertex. It's at positive one minus three. Okay. So that's going to now be the lowest point of my new parabola because I know my vertex is the lowest point. So let's find another couple of points on either side. So... Let's see, originally I went out, I went to the left 2 and I was up at 4. So let's see what happens now to the point negative 2, 4. I do my, my vertical stretch first and I get negative 2, 8. I've doubled my y value. Now I subtract 3 from my y value and I add 1 to my x value and I get negative 1, 5. So I'm at negative 1 and I'm at the height of 5 right there. Okay, now what? Uh, negative 1, 1. Again, I double my y values, y times 2. I get negative 1, 2. It doesn't matter whether I move to the right 1 and down 3 or go down 3 and move to the right 1. The order doesn't matter. Let's go down 3 from here. So I subtract 3 from my, my y value of 2 and I get negative 1. And now I add 1 to my, y va my x value, and I get 0, negative 1. 0, negative 1. And believe it or not, folks, I have enough points right now to sketch this graph. You say, wait a minute, you only got one half of your graph here. You just have a couple of values that are to the left of your vertex value of 1. Well, this is even symmetry. So look. If you went one step to the left of 1 to get your 0 here, and that was at negative 1, by symmetry about your vertex point, where will I be at negative 1 again? Where will my y value be negative 1 again? If you go straight across, what's going to be the x value that gives me negative 1 here? 2. You just go one step to the right of 1. So by symmetry around your vertex there, well, it's actually symmetry around this vertical line right here. If you drop a vertical line straight down through your vertex, the x value of your vertex, the equation of this line is x equals 1. It's a vertical line. Your new parabola is going to be symmetric about that line. That's called the line of symmetry. Line of symmetry. With our parent function, the line of symmetry was x equals 0. We call it the famous y-axis. But now with the vertex shifting to the right 1 and down 3, my new line of symmetry has moved to the right 1 unit. So now I can just copy these two points right here, and through even symmetry, I can get exactly the same y-coordinates, and voila, I've got five points on this parabola. I'm done. There it is.
So that's a quick way to sketch it. You could have done these two points as well if you didn't think of the even symmetry idea. You could have just found these points right here, continued this idea to come up with the two points we just graphed through symmetry. Um, so where did our vertex end up? What, what are the coordinates of our vertex? The one that we ended up with, with the transformations. One negative three, all right? So look at the original uh, form of our equation, g of x. Can you find the vertex in that form anywhere? Can you find the vertex in that form? One negative three? Someone said, mm hmm, was that Katie? So where do you see it, Katie? Where do you see it in this? G of x equals 2 times x minus 1 quantity squared minus 3. Where do you see the vertex in there? All right, well, it's a po you're subtracting a positive 1, right? Yes. Th this is actually a positive 1 you're subtracting. So that gives you the x value of your vertex, and then the y value of your vertex is negative 3. Basically, if you say to yourself, if you say to yourself, you shift to the right, 1, by your horizontal, you're going to go from 0 to positive 1. And this tells you that your y values are all going to be decreased by 3, so you go down 3, so negative 3. So you can look at this formula, if it's in this form, and whatever comes after your subtraction, that's the x value of your vertex. And whatever this number is, in this case, it's a negative 3. You can say I'm subtracting 3, so why are you changing your story, Linda? Because I know that to find the vertex, I'm looking at this form. This is the vertex form of a quadratic. And h is the x value of your vertex, and k is the y value. So notice here, it should have an addition sign in front, and it doesn't. So if you change this to addition, it's plus negative 3. So that's why we read that as negative 3, but we read the 1 here as positive 1. So the vertex form of your quadratic function gives you the vertex right away. You can, boom, plot your vertex right away. And this is what the vertex form of your quadratic function looks like. Your book calls it the standard form. I just want you to write above it vertex form as well because I think vertex really tells you what the vertex is. What this, excuse me, what this form helps you with. It helps you find the vertex by just, boom, looking at it, you can get it very quickly. Most books call this the vertex form, but for some reason your books calls it the standard form. So everywhere I write the standard form, I'm just writing it because that's what your book calls it. You might hear me say vertex form. I'll try to do both as we go throughout the lecture. So again, if I gave you this general formula right here, f of x equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, what transformations have happened from your parent function? If you look at this, what transformations have happened? What are the transformations that have happened if you look at this general function from your parent function? How is it shifted vertically? How is this shifted vertically? It's shifted k units. And if k is negative, right, it's going to shift down k units. And if k is positive, then it shifts up. Remember, it acts just like we think. So if k is a plus 3, it's going to shift up 3. If it's a negative 3, it shifts down 3. Then what about the h value inside? So this is the k value. So what about the h value? As it's written right now, yep, Chris? It will shift right h units if h is a positive number. So if it says x take away 2, it shifts right 2 units. And conversely, it will shift left h units if h is a negative number. 
Because if H is negative, then what's going to look what's that going to look like inside? It will say x take away a negative number, which will look like x plus h, and we know that moves it to the left h units. And then what about a? We've got a happening here. What's a going to do? Stretch or shrink it which way? Huh? Vertical, stretch or shrink, depending on whether A is greater than 1. Wow, that just changed colors on me. I wonder how that happened. That's cool. If A is greater than 1, it's going to stretch. And if A is between 1 and 0, it's going to shrink. What if A itself is negative? What does that do to my parabola? If A is negative, what happens to the shape of my parabola or the direction? Yeah, it turns. It, be, it opens, we say opens downward. And that's what all this stuff in the box is here. So let's, let's fill this in. The standard form, again, I'm going to put vertex form right above that. The vertex or the standard form is convenient because it immediately identifies the vertex of the parabola H comma K. If A is greater than 0, the parabola opens upwards. It's a happy parabola. Happy. If A is negative, then the parabola opens downward. It's a sad parabola. Ooh. If the absolute value of A is small, like a fraction, then the parabola is going to shrink. It's going to get closer to the x-axis, and that's going to make it open up like a really wide parabola. So if this was our parent function, and we shrink the distances to the x-axis, then this parabola becomes very flat and very wide. So this is when the absolute value of A is small. When the absolute value of A is large, like if it was 100, this thing would be so, it would be stretched, it would be so skinny and narrow. Okay, so this is when the absolute value of A is large. So if we're trying to sketch an accurate sketch of a parabola, and we can, and it's in this vertex form, boom, we can look at this form and we know whether it opens upward or downward. We know whether it's going to be a really wide a really skinny parabola. We're going to know whether it opens up or down. And then if we find the x and y intercepts, we're golden. We've got enough points to really graph a parabola pretty quickly. So these are all the key ideas to graph a parabola. So let's just put them in um, some kind of like summarized form. So to summarize, You've got most of these written down on your next problem. I'm just doing it for you. The key points for, for um, graphing a, a parabola pretty quickly is you want to find the vertex. You want to know whether it opens upward or downward. You want to find the y-intercept. And then, once you find the y-intercept, you can find the point that's symmetric to it by just using your symmetry idea, the point symmetric to the y-intercept. That will give you another point for graphing. And then your x-intercept or intercepts, if any. OK? So those are the key features of doing a quick, accurate sketch of any parabola. So let's do it. Let's try one. So here's a parabola. I have it in my vertex form or what your book calls your standard form. So I can quickly tell what my what has happened to my zero zero vertex. So if you look at this, you don't have to read you don't have to get all mixed up with the H's and the K's and positives and negatives because you've worked so much with transformations now, you can say what's happened to zero zero. It has shifted to the right one and it's moved up 4. So this is my new vertex, 1, 4. The values of A, the value of A is out front here. It's negative 1. 
A is negative 1. H is 1. And K is 4. So already I know a lot about this parabola. I know where its vertex is. The vertex is at 1, 4, so I can put a dot right there. 1, 4 is my vertex. It's also 4 is the maximum value of this function. It's the maximum value because I know this function is going to open downward. So it's going to open downward. So in terms of my range, I'll never get any number in my range higher than 4. It's the maximum value. We know it opens downward because a equals negative 1. a is less than 0. So let's find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is when what is 0? How do I find the y-intercept? And x is 0. So I'm finding f of 0. I'm going to put 0 in everywhere I see my x value. And here I get negative, which is negative 1 out in front. And negative 1 inside the parentheses, I square it and add 4. So I get negative 1 times positive 1 plus 4, which is 3. So my y-intercept is 0, 3. So I go to 0 and I go up 3. There we go. So I've plotted my y-intercept. Now remember, my line of symmetry is this line, x equals 1. It comes right down through my x value of my vertex. So my whole parabola is going to fold over that line, x equals 1. So at 0, I'm 3. And I'm one unit to the left of my vertex. So if I go one unit to the right, I have another point right on my graph right now that's symmetric to the point 0, 3. It's called 2, 3 because it's one point to the right of the vertex. So the, now I find, so this is step four and a half. I find the point symmetric to my y-intercept. And that point is 2, 3. So I just walk one step to the other side of my vertex. And through symmetry, I get to put in even symmetry, I get to put in that point, 2, 3. So once you get your x-intercepts, which we call the zeros of the function, or the solutions to a quadratic equation set equal to 0, we've got two more points, and we're all set. That's all we have to do. And we can get a quick and accurate sketch. So what do I do to find the x-intercepts of this parabola? If any, sometimes parabolas don't have x-intercepts. Might be, uh, it might have been shifted to the right 3 and up 5. It will, and it, let's say it opens upward, it would never have any x-intercepts. So how do I find the x-intercepts, Caitlin? Yeah, so that's when the y value is 0. What's y equal to? y is equal to f of x. So where I see f of x, I put 0, and I get negative 1 times x minus 1 squared plus 4. So this is a quadratic equation set equal to 0. So we spent a class solving these equations, and there's lots of different approaches. Some of you might want to use your quadratic formula, but to do that, you've got to put it back in the ax squared plus bx plus c form. Um, there's several approaches to doing this. Um, anybody want to start with a step here or how you would go about solving it? There's a couple of different approaches. Anybody want to start us off or what you might do at your seats? Chris? Okay, so you would square the x minus 1. Okay, so Chris is going to have us square the x minus 1. And what would I get when I square the quantity x minus 1? What would I get, Chris? Let's let's do it out the long way, okay? X minus 1 times X minus 1. So we get the X squared, yeah? What else do we get in here? Minus, minus 2X, because that's our outer and our inner term. And then our final term is plus 1. Okay, so I get X squared minus 2X plus 1. But don't forget that minus sign is out front of the whole darn thing. And then I get, my I get to add my 4. 
So once I distribute that negative sign through, each of those, the signs of uh, each of the coefficients here, the one in front of x squared, the negative 2 and the 1, are just going to change to their opposite. So I get negative 1x squared plus 2x minus 1 plus 4. Almost done. I've got two like terms right here, two constants that I get to combine. So I get negative x squared plus 2x plus 3 is equal to 0. So you can either now use your quadratic formula on this or you could factor it. Most of you do not like factoring when you have something out front of x squared that's different than positive 1. So how can you change this? Does anybody know what you could do to make this a positive 1? You have an equation, so you have the right to do something to both sides without affecting the original equation. So what could you do so that you have 1 in front of x squared and it's really easy to factor, Katie? Divide both sides by negative 1, yeah. Make it easy to factor. 0 divided by negative 1 doesn't do a darn thing to 0. And now each, each sign here, when you divide anything by negative 1, each sign here will change back to its opposite. So this becomes x squared minus 2x minus 3. That's going to be nice and easy to factor because you're asking for what factors of 3 differ by 2. 3 and 1. So this becomes x minus 3 times x plus 1. You set each factor equal to 0 and solve for x. And you get the number x equals 3 is a solution to this quadratic equation. And x equals negative 1 is a solution. And that means the point 3, 0 and the point negative 1, 0 are x-intercepts of this parabola. So you go back up and where you, you put in the point negative 1, 0, and you put in the point 3, 0 right here. And that's plenty of points to get a fairly accurate sketch of this parabola. So just connect your dots, and you're done. Okay, so that's it. It's all, the, all you have to do to sketch uh, a parabola when you're given its form in standard form or what we call the vertex form as well. Any questions on any of these steps to get any of these five points that we have here? Either 1, 3, 0, 3, 2, 3, or the x-intercepts. Any, any questions at all? All right, so let's take a look at the next section here. Five, change the function from the standard form into this form. Well, we just did that a minute ago. Chris helped us to do that. We just changed this. We did this step first. We squared our, our binomial x minus 1 and got this. And we changed all the signs, added 4, and now we have ne negative x squared minus 2x plus 4. Plus, oh, you're right, it should be a plus. Yep. All right. And that should be a plus 3, sorry. I'm going way too fast. Okay. So we just did this. So we, we've seen that f of x equals negative 1, <coughs> excuse me, times x minus 1, the quantity x minus 1 squared. <coughs> Sorry. Plus 4. That's standard form of vertex form. It's exactly the same thing as f of x equals negative 1x squared plus 2x plus 3. So look, in this form, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. In this form, you see your y-intercept right away, 0, 3. Notice that the a values are the same in both of them. The a values always remain the same, no matter whether you're looking at this form called the standard form or your vertex form, whether you have it written out into its three separate terms. The A is the same in both. So the only thing this form tells you, folks, is your y-intercept is 0, 3, and your parabola opens downward. That's all it tells you. This one tells you your vertex is at 1, 4, and your parabola opens downward. It has exactly the same shape as x squared because x squared has a 1 in front. 
So this just says it doesn't get any wider or narrower. It's exactly the same shape as x squared. It's just that it's, it's opening downward. So the moral of the story is I really like the vertex form. It gives me more information for graphing. What if I'm given my equation in this form, ax squared plus bx plus c, how do I quickly get my vertex? Well, the good news for you is there's a formula for the vertex. To get the formula for the vertex, to get the formula for the h value of your vertex, you do negative b over 2a. That should look familiar to you, I hope, because if you think about your quadratic function, Here's your negative b over 2a. It's the first negative b over 2a is the first term if you separate this out into two fractions. So if you separate it out instead of keeping it as a single fraction like this, this is the x-coordinate of your vertex. And when you think about it, let's go back one minute so I can show you how this works. Come back here. Let's look at this. Our, our vertex was at 1, right? And then we found that one x-intercept was located at 3, and the other one was located at negative 1. So our x-intercepts were two units away from our x-value of our vertex. So if we look at this form, if we look at this form right here, and we try to find the vertex. Let's suppose we didn't know what the vertex was. If we look at this form, we know that a is negative 1 and b is 2. So if we're trying to find the x value of, of our vertex, which we're calling h, we say the opposite of b over 2 times negative 1, which is negative 2 over negative 2, which is 1. That's what we just saw. It was located at 1. Now. That means if we come down here to our quadratic formula, this is going to be 1. When we put b in, take its opposite and divide it by 2. So if one of our x-intercepts is 2 units to the right, which is 3, and the other one was 2 units to the left, which was negative 1, that means when we finish this off, when we actually put in the values for b squared minus 4ac, take its square root, divided by 2a, we better come up with a number plus 2 and minus 2 because the vertex is halfway between your x-intercepts if you have them. So let's just check it out. Let's put b minus 4ac 2a in here. What was b again? b was 2, a was negative 1, and what was c? c was 3. So if you take apart your quadratic formula, the first term here is the x value of your vertex, and then you go to the right and to the left, so many units to get your x axis, your x intercepts. So let's see. It better come out to be two, or my theory's all screwed up. What was b again? From looking at it, was it a two? Two square? From this, I don't. I have to keep scrolling up. B was two. Okay. Yep. Minus four times a was one and c was three. All over two times a. So this is the square root of four plus 12 all over negative 2, which is square root of 16 over negative 2, which is 4 over negative 2, which is negative 2. So when you add negative 2, you're going to go to the left from 1, 2 units. And when you subtract negative 2, that's going to be a plus 2. You go to the right. So that's what this quadratic formula tells you, is you never really have to memorize the um, formula for the x-coordinate of your vertex because it's right there in your quadratic formula, which I know you've all got memorized because we sang it a thousand times. Well, I'm exaggerating. So if you have your, your equation in this form, boom, negative b over 2a gives you your h value. And then to get your y value, you just plug in your h value into your function. It looks nasty, but it's very easy to do. It just looks, it looks harder than it re really is. So here's our quadratic function. It's not in our vertex form. So how do we find the vertex? To find the vertex, 
You simply identify what A is. We just did it and what B is. Okay? And then you do negative B over 2A. So that's negative 4 over 2 times negative 1, which is negative 4 over negative 2. And now I know the x value of my vertex. It's called H. And now I have to find my y value. How do I find my y value? I know what my x value is. Plug in 2. X, this is, remember, h is an x value. So to get my y value, I plug in 2 into my function. My function says take any input, and let's take a look at 2 here, and out will pop the y value. So we put negative, and we do 2 squared plus 4 times 2 plus 1. That gives me negative 4 plus 8 plus 1 gives me 4 plus 1, which is 5. So this is equal to my k value, or the y coordinate of my vertex. So my vertex is 2, 5. 2, 5. Boom. Do I open up or down? Down. OK. Now it says write the quadratic, form, the quadratic function in standard form. Standard form, remember, is called vertex form. OK. So vertex form looks like this. f of x equals, we still start off with a, just so like when we say ax squared plus bx, we always start with a. But now vertex form, a standard form, looks like this. We've already identified a right up here as negative 1. It never changes from one form to the other. We know our h value is 2, so we've shifted to the right 2. And our k value for our vertex is 5, and we've shifted up 5. And if you look at your original vertex for your parent function, it's gone to the right 2, and it's shifted up 5. Okay. So now this is the standard form. So you can go from one form to the other. Now, what's the value of this original form? I can get my y-intercept very quickly, because the y-intercept is when x is 0. Boom, it's 1. So I know what my y-intercept is right away, 0, 1. So I'm at 0, 1. I've got to stick with being red now. 0, 1 is right here. Remember, my line of symmetry comes straight down through my vertex at x equals 2. That's my line of symmetry. So what point, what are the coordinates of the point that's symmetric to my y-intercept? Here's my y-intercept. I'm at 0. My vertex is located at x equals 2. So how many steps do I go on the other side of my vertex to get at 1? How many steps do I walk to get at the same height of 1? So I, I have perfect symmetry. Where's my mirror image? How far do I stretch my finger for the other side? I go to 4, which is 2 units away from my line of symmetry. Right, because I have 2 units here. Here's 2 units away. I go 2 units to the other side. I'm exactly the same height. And then you can find your x-intercepts like we did before. I'm just going to skip that part and just do a really quick sketch of this parabola. So set the equation equal to 0. You'll have to use your quadratic formula to find your x-intercepts. And they'll be irrational. So you'll have to use your calculator. You'll get irrational root, irrational solutions. So you can estimate them, like estimate them to like two dec decimal places or one decimal place, I guess. One or two decimal places. Oh, that's not writing over there. Say one decimal place. And then just put them into your x on your x-axis just to get a quick sketch. So nothing's new about the last step there from what we just did. It's just you have to use a quadratic formula. Any questions on going from the form of the quadratic equation that you're used to seeing it in to making it into this vertex form? That's kind of like the skill you need to be able to go back and forth between the two. Any questions now before we move along? Anything at all? 
okay, so, so far we've been given an equation and we've drawn its graph. Can we go backwards and get the equation for a quadratic function from looking at its graph? So here's a quadratic function. Let's identify some points. We want to have uh, give the quadratic function in both the vertex form or our standard form. We want this form and we want this form. That's what it says here. So let's uh, let's put one form in a different color, just so we can. Let's do purple here. So purple is the way we're used to seeing it, ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay. Can anybody look at this picture of this graph and put in any values for a, b, and c, or h and k in any one of the forms? Can anybody find some piece? Katie, what can you find? You can find h and k. Where's h and k? The vertex. So right here, we have the vertex. I'm going to put that as red since it's going to go in the red formula. It's been shifted right three units and up five. So to shift something right, it's x take away three quantity squared. And up five means plus five. So I can get that far. Is that, a, is that done? Am I done with this equation? Why not, Tom? I need A. I need A. Oh, almost done. Okay, can I get any part of the purple equation? Can I get an A, a B, or a C there in the purple equation? The you can get the y-intercept. Anything else? No. Bummer. The y-intercept is 23, so in the purple equation, the only letter I can identify is C. Hmm. The purple equation, i got to find A and B. But geez, in my top equation, my red equation, once I find A, I'm all set. I think I'm going to work with the red equation because I've got a lot less to do. I only have to find the value of A. What can you tell me about A, if anything? Can you tell me anything about A? Anything about A? Not its number, but anything. Isabel? It's positive. So because it's opening up with our parabola is opening up with. So when we do our math to find A, we better get a positive. Oops, let's keep this red. So we're going to come down here, and we have f of x equals a times the quantity x minus 3 squared plus 5. Well, what's a math student to do to get a? You've got h and k, and you've got to find a. Let's go back just a few weeks and think about this problem. Find an equation of a straight line. Of a line if the slope equals 3 and it goes through a point. I don't care what the point is. Let's call the point 2, negative 5. If I gave you that problem, you have two approaches, right? You could use your slope intercept form of a line which looks like this. Or you could use your point slope form of a line, which looks like this. And if you use your slope intercept form, where you see m, you replace it with 3. And notice you're stuck finding one final value, b. We're in the same spot right now, folks. We're stuck needing to find one last value, a. The only difference is that now instead of calling it y, we're calling it f of x. That's the only difference, really, between what we have left to do. So if I gave you this linear function with that information, what would you do here to find the value of b? What would you do? Plug in a point. Any point in the world, a point that lies on the line. So you would plug in this point, that for x, and that for f of x or y, and you would solve for b. So just like you did with lines, you'd put a negative 5 in here, you'd put a 2 in for x, and then you would find that b was negative 11. And you're done. You plug in negative 11, you have your entire equation. There you go. And if you had this one, you actually would take that point and plug it right in here, and you're all set, and 
And if you solve that for y, you'd get exactly the same answer. I want you to see that when you're trying to find the equation for a parabola from a graph, once you plug in your vertex, you're in exactly the same situation as you were here with your straight line. All you need to do is identify one point that's on your parabola, put in the x value for x and the y value for f of x, and then you can solve for a. Do I know any point on this parabola? Any point at all that's on this parabola? Yeah. In fact, how many other points beside the vertex do I know? Two. You can pick 0, 23, or you can pick 6, 23. I'm going to pick 0. So I'm going to plug in the point 0, 23. I'm going to put 0 in for x. And when x is 0, my output is 23. Now I have everything I need to find the value for a. I just solved this equation. I've got everything I need, so let's go ahead and do it. Negative 3 quantity squared plus 5. So now I subtract 5 from both sides. I get 18 equals a times negative 3 squared is 9. I divide both sides by 9, and I get a is 2. I'm all done. I can now write at least the standard form or the vertex form of my parabola. It looks like this. And if I want to write it out in the other form, my purple form, what's my purple form going to do? My purple form, I have to multiply this all out. x squared minus 6x plus 9 plus 5. Double everything. You already know what to expect as your C term. It better come out to be 23 or you messed up somewhere in your algebra. Ooh, good. There's my 23. It's not letting me write there. 2x squared minus 12x plus 23. I don't know why I can't write over there. All right. So you can go from one form to the other. So don't let this idea, like a lot of students get right here to the vertex form and they don't remember how to solve for a. It's no different than a straight line. Just pick any point off your parabola, put it in for x, put it in for f of x, and solve your equation for a. It's, it never changes. Well, once I see in the purple one, um, to get to the purple one, now that I know my, my vertex form or my standard form, Ryan, I just multiply this all out so I can come down here to the ax squared plus bx plus c. So I squared, I squared. Yeah, it's, yep, yep. So to go from, I can go from this form to this form by performing all the steps by squaring this, then doubling everything, and then adding 5. So here's my final form. 2x squared minus 12x plus 23. So you can see in both of these forms, both of them, the a values have not changed. The a value here is 2. The a value here is 2. You can look at your graph and see that your y-intercept is 23 from this equation. Your y-intercept there is 23. So you've got some kind of, and then, of course, this equation you can find, you can look at that vertex and see that you've got the correct vertex here. Okay. So the only other thing you have to do here is uh, some story opportunities. So I'm going to skip this first one. Um, whoops. Let's write this down. I think you know this already from a little conversation we've had. What key feature of a quadratic function marks its maximum or minimum value? What key feature marks the maximum of, or minimum value? Our minimum point. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it, Patrick. Vertex, right. And depending on whether you're, oops, I better change my, uh, the vertex, right. So anytime you read a problem and it asks you for maximum height, minimum cost, maximum distance, minimum anything, best, worst, 
that's going to you're going to be looking for the y value of your vertex the k value anytime you see those superlatives used in any kind of story opportunity so let's go right to um, the I'm going to skip 11 this is in your book so you can see this in your book refer to your book for this and let's take a look at a very standard type of problem that you will see a story opportunity is maximizing area because area is measured in square units square your quadratic the highest power is square so any area problem two-dimensional area problem would use a quadratic here, any rectangle or square that you might find. So let's read through this. Want to read it for us, Drew? Okay, so one of the key things when you're reading this are you looking at a situation you see this word largest right here so in your mind you think vertex 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 okay and not just the whole vertex the k value of your vertex that's going to give you your largest area it's the k k value of your vertex all right so now you've got to find your way to that vertex you've got to come up with a quadratic function and to get there you have to use some of this information in the first sentence start by drawing a picture anybody know how I might draw a picture of this first sentence what I might do okay. yeah Am I using for you came in a little late William so you weren't here no it's all right you weren't here when they read it because you were out are we using all four sides for this particular rectangle right okay so I used three sides here we go boom 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 what's my other side the riverbank right so let's use blue for the river ah oh, that's supposed to be blue come on blue along here so this is a very standard you find this in just about every single college algebra textbook you'd look at how can I come up with an equation now from that first sentence? What could I do? First, I have to define some variables. We can never forget that step. So anybody want to help me with some definition of variables here? Nobody wants to help me do anything today. Huh? You can't. Okay. Who can help me define the variable here? Any variable. What are we looking at when we're dealing with a rectangular pin? What variables? Thank you. Length and width. So do you have any particular letters you want to use for the to represent length and width? It's up to you. X and Y, right? So X and Y, what's X going to be? The length of the rectangular pin, I'll tell you later what I was saying, okay? Measured in feet, and Y is the width of the rectangular pin measured in feet, okay? Now, which one you call the length and which one you call the width doesn't matter. Okay, I'm going to call this the length, and I've got two of them, and this the width. All right. How can I use whatever numbers x are to come up with an equation what's the only equation I can come up with right now and have a constant in it I have real numbers that I see somewhere in this problem yeah if I added up all these distances all the way around that's called the perimeter perimeter in this case doesn't have all four sides and this is a key to all of these area problems. They're going to give you the perimeter because the perimeter will help you to, to define one variable in terms of the other. So you say 400 feet is equal to adding up all these sides of my fence. And if I simplify this, I get two x's and one y. Okay. Now you take this and you solve it for y. 
and you might ask why are you solving for y instead of x just because y is the easiest one to solve for because it has a coefficient of 1. If I solve for x I'm going to have to divide by 2 and that, then I got to deal with yucky fractions. So it's just simpler. You could do either one. So y is going to be subtract 2x from both sides. So y is going to be 400 minus 2x. So I put that all in parentheses. OK, so now I have y in terms of x. And so now my second, so my second um, step here is to find an equation for the area. The area of a rectangle is the width times the length. But now I want to be able to talk about my area as just a function of x. So the only thing I see is x. So it's x times y. And y is now called 400 minus 2x. So I have a function now, x times, so this is the length times the width. But now my width is being talked about in terms of x. So I can write this as the area is just a function of x. All right, how do I maximize? How do I find the maximum area here? Well, all I have to do is turn this into the form that I'm used to seeing, ax squared plus bx plus c. And I use my vertex formula to find it. So let's multiply through by x. I get 400x minus 2x squared. The order's a little different than what you're used to seeing it. So if you just want to rearrange the terms here, it's negative 2x squared plus 400x. So what's a and b here? What's the values of a and b? A is, and B is, negative 2, no, just the, it's just the constant, yeah, just the constant. And what about B here? Well, 400. So remember, if I graph this parabola right here, it's a downward parabola. It's going to look something like this. I'm not putting all the points in. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the x value that gives you the maximum area. So you're trying to find the values of your vertex. So we just found out, let's see, how do I find the h value of my vertex, which is also its x value of the vertex? That's negative b over 2a. B is 400, so it's negative 400 over 2 times negative 2, which is negative 400 over negative 4, which is 100. So that means if, I, if my length of my fence is 100 feet, I'm going to have a maximum area. So to find the maximum area, you have two choices. You can just go back to your diagram right back here, put 100 in for each x. And if the whole distance around is 200, well, you've already used 200 feet, so y is 200. And you can just say, OK, my area is, my area is 100 times 200. And you can also get that from the formula you had right above x is 100, and 400 minus 200 is 200, so your maximum area is 20,000 square feet. So your answer is the maximum area is 20,000 square feet, and that would be the y value of your vertex. So right up here, you could put in 20,000. That would be the y value. So that's the whole kit and caboodle. You'll have some problems to do uh, on your homework, but your homework's not due until Monday since your test is on Friday. Um, you have, this is not on the test, no, no. I never include the material from the day before. So um, you have some problems to do, a group activity, but I do want to ask you, uh, encourage you, to please get here as early as possible on Friday. So I know you don't have a 10 o'clock class, and I'm going to ask Jean in the studio on Friday if I can, she'll take over the studio. She usually comes in five or 10 minutes after I'm there. So try to get here early to take the quiz so you can have 
enough time, I mean, excuse me, to take the test so you have enough time to complete it, okay? So you can start working on these um, problems now and we'll see if you have any questions. We did a lot of work today as lecture. I apologize for that, but there was a lot of material to get through.